Welcome, guys, to the third episode of The Artist Pass. Today, we have uh, one of my good friends and uh, our third guest on this podcast, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hi, brother. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing? Very good. It's such an honor to have you on uh, the third episode, um, especially with uh, the start of this podcast. Uh, We have some great things coming up soon, and I know you're visiting us from Turkey. How's your trip in here in L.A.? It's been good. It's been fulfilling, I would say. Yeah? Is it your first time here? Uh, yeah, it's my first time here. Awesome. So what brings you here to Los Angeles? Uh, actually, it's like a glimpse of fresh air. Uh, I live in Turkey. I'm based in Turkey. And it's like an off-season there, DJing-wise. So I wanted to come to the States, see something different, embrace the culture, see all my longtime friends here, and have a good time. Okay. So you're based in Turkey. Are you Turkish? Uh, I'm half Turkish, half English. Okay, awesome. And uh, have you like were you born and raised in Turkey? Is your upbringing from there, or uh, I was born in Leeds, England, but I was raised in Turkey in my whole life. Okay, awesome. And uh, how did uh, how did you how did the music thing start for you? Because one of the reasons I started this podcast is mainly to kind of bring light or exposure to artists that are in this industry and kind of give them a biography about like their upbringing or just how music and them clashed and clashed together. So would you tell us a little bit more? Um, well, I used to play basketball in my high school years, and when I decided to quit because I was not going to be a professional basketball player and I had the knowledge of that, uh, I started going out to parties. And like in high school, electronic music was just peaking, EDM was a thing, and I, was, I started going to those parties. But it didn't necessarily blend in well for me because EDM was not my style of music, and when I started... Looking deeper, I found Deep House, which I was really intrigued about. And since my youth, I've always liked to collect and like, I used to write every single track on, on like a note, notebook and I would give it to my dad and he would burn CDs for me. So when I saw that side of the industry, Deep House and House, disco, I started going to those parties. And suddenly it, that also became really popular and electronic music, music became a big movement. And first I started selling tickets for the promoters. And then because I was English, they used me um, on the hospitality side of things. And while doing the hospitality, I was watching all these artists. And while watching, I started learning, like what button works for what? How do they maintain a crowd? How, How to keep the energy up all the time? And I started trying, let's say. And then it just, took a blast after my second year in the industry and I had good mentors which I followed I literally used to take drinks to the DJs at venues so I could be in booth with them to watch them yeah so yeah that's how it all started okay no that's very interesting so you you mentioned mentorship mentorship how how important was that and into your like you know your progress in music is uh, because nowadays it's there's a, there's a lot of competition and maybe like when you grew up, it was a little bit different, but do you think mentorship from someone else or someone that's been in the game for a long, longer period of time, is that important or? Of course it is. Like back in the day, the, the important people in the industry and the DJs, as they used to use their juniors as, you know, picking up the bags, cleaning up the records and everything. And I think like genuinely there are certain ways to learn and evolve. It's like a learn, adapt and embrace type of thing. And what I saw was uh, playing music in the right time in the right place and keeping the composure was the, one of the biggest lessons, which I think is, is way easier right now. You could just have like a good Spotify playlist and you can just directly get into it. But we were sent to restaurants to play. We were sent to parties doing early hours. And like playing slow music was eye-opening for me. Plus, it, it made me have a bigger collection. Like I said, I'm a, I like collecting music. And slowly, when you have the grasp of the equipment, it would like become better every single set. And like keeping that composure is actually important. Like my mentors, I was lucky because I was always put on stages on the proper time. And every single I pulled something off properly, they would give me a better slot. Okay. So yeah. That's no, I remember we spoke about kind of like playing, in the, especially in the beginning of like your career, 
uh, playing slower music or getting those gigs that require you to kind of be more patient or just give it a little bit more uh, creativity because when you're playing the slower style stuff earlier in the night, it, it's harder to curate a good atmosphere for the audience because it's it's a different expectation. You're not just playing big songs, big drops, bangers, and it's kind of harder to curate a good time. And do, would you think that like that gave you a better like perspective on what's on like what a DJ is supposed to do, or what do you think like uh, the importance of playing that slow style lounge music in the beginning or not necessarily lounge, but something a little bit along the lines of like dinner time or just kind of like uh, a social, social like atmosphere. Well, I think it's all about setting the tone. And if you rush something, like if you look at the crowd and the crowd's not there yet, but you're rushing, it doesn't resolve in the best way. But if you set the tone well and curate the night in the proper, because you have to see what's coming. Like if there's a DJ after you, you have to respect that. You shouldn't be playing all these bangers or clashing yeah. tracks to each other. It, it's just not how it should be, in my opinion, by the way. Now it could be different. But it is important to set the tone at this very good level so the DJ after you picks it up and plays the right music at the right set time. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. There's a, there's a lot of um, opinions about these things, of course, and we see it more often than not nowadays with like artists kind of not matching or curating the right vibe for the headliner or for the uh, f for the artist that's kind of uh, bringing on the the night. There are a lot of artists just kind of, j especially the openers, the the amateurs, I would say, or like the people that just the artists that just started. They kind of just go head in and they like to play whatever they're they're into. They don't give any consideration to it. Uh, it's it's very different from I, I would say probably the time that you started playing music. Nowadays, yeah. the, since with the big dilution of like DJs, everybody's kind of just head in, let me do what I want, and it's it's kind of different I would say from when you uh, you started. And I think playing in Turkey I think is very different than playing here. Um, yeah, Turkish people are, are different. It's harder to set a tone and get things going, but interestingly. There, were, there was a lot of room of improvement at my time. I started around 2014, 13, 14. And being a DJ and put, being on big stages and important venues was extremely hard. You had to make your way through. You, you had to go through every single process. And then you would be fulfilled and put on stage. You, it, it wasn't given, it was earned, they would say. Okay. Which I think is a good word to explain this. Um, but yeah, like Turkey was welcoming to me. I was lucky because my name is Jamie. I'm not Turkish fully. And that's also a good way to, I was lucky like having that in yeah. my pocket okay. as a gun. But yeah. No. So how, how would you say like the scene in Turkey is different in terms of like, uh, you said this is like your off season. So what does it look like to be on season there? Are there events every day of the week? Is it just the weekends? Uh, what are the hours like? Because here in Los Angeles, we see it's a very, it's a very interesting scene. I would say with like how this the weekend starts Thursday, Friday, and then by Sunday night, you're pretty much done with the events. There's nothing going on. Two a.m. is the cutoff time. Is that how it is in Turkey when you are like uh, on tour? Or I would say like in your on season. Uh, well, the regulations changed. Now we're supposed to finish music at two a.m. in the morning, which it wasn't like that. Every venue had different regulations, and with the tourism uh, regulation, you could play until 5 a.m. Okay. And usually it was like Thursday to Sunday type of vibe, uh, but with DJing becoming a really big hot thing, especially in the season, it's like Monday to Sunday, it never stops. But with the, of course, with the financial gap, it's, now it's harder because going out in Turkey is an expensive Thing. I mean, you, you, you have to work your ass off a month and you can only go out like twice or three times a week. Okay. So you, you would say it's similar but different in, 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 that, in that sort. Do you think the audience is willing to keep going there or compared to here? Uh, now that you've had I think like it's pretty much the same. Like LA is like bigger Turkey, bigger Istanbul. It's quite similar in so many ways. Things like what I, uh, what I saw, I would say. Uh, but of course, there, there is more diversity in sound. Okay. 
like some venues have been going on for really, really long period of time and they have their certain characteristics and people, I mean, a melodic DJ wouldn't go and play at a house venue, let's say. Okay. So they're, they're kind of categorized a little bit. Yeah. I remember I visited Turkey. Um, well, actually I do visit Turkey quite often. Um, I have some family there and I, I've been out and about, I've been to the, this uh, venue called Cafe. I think. Cafe, I've never Cafe heard. Solomon. It's by the beach a little bit. Um, it's in Istanbul, but kind of up a little bit by Bebek. Um, Cafe something. Uh, Solomon played there that, that day. Really? Yeah, it was an outdoor venue. Um, I've, I've never heard I'm of not, it, man. I, <laughs> no, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of, uh, lot of kind of different music, and I've been to, what is it called, Klein? Yeah, that's like the, the biggest the, club right now. Okay. They also have like a couple of other venues. Uh, they're big in the industry right now. I think they, ha they hold a lot of the cards, I would say. Okay, and do you play mostly in Istanbul, or where, where, like, where are your gigs at? And what kind of, uh, what kind of music do you bring? Because we, we didn't really kind of explain to the audience or just kind of talk about what kind of music you bring to, 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 the, to the scene or to the atmosphere you play in. Well, uh, I would consider myself as a DJ more than an artist. Okay. I'll be honest about that. And what's, and, like, let's define both first before we... Well, if like, you're an artist, then you have your own certain way, let's say. Okay. And you would have your own tracks to back it up. You would be a full package, let's say. You would have the full grasp on everything. Being a DJ is about adapting to environments and reading the crowd. So sometimes you don't necessarily play the music that you always want to. Uh, but uh, being over 10, 10 years now, at least I have the tool to, I like to play it more house, minimal, okay. disco, sometimes Afro, Latin. Uh, it's just about reading the crowd, right? And seeing your environment. You know, it's, it's very big that you said like, I'm a DJ, not an artist, because there's a big distinction, I think, between those things. And just because you, you know, flip knobs or, not, or know how to, you know, use the equipment doesn't make you a DJ, I would say. But the fact that you made that distinction is very, very important because every DJ should be able to adapt to the music they play. But I think also every artist should be able to do the same thing, but within their own sound. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, I am working on the artist side of things, okay. by the way. It's, it's not, I'm not like ruling that out. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what's, uh, what, why, why do you say you're a DJ? Is it, is it because you're, you're, do you do anything else other than uh, being a DJ? Or is it because it just takes a longer time to curate the artist uh, identity? Well, um, DJing is my strong suit because I like to read crowds and, you know, be one with the crowd. Uh, being the, art, the artist side is, it takes time. And when you're a DJ frequently playing, traveling all the time, you don't necessarily have the time to sit down and work on your stuff, work on your craft. And we also get into the studio with friends. But if you are not a creator then you shouldn't be walking around, waltzing around like you're an artist. And you, you, should, you should know who you are and what okay. you embrace and what you give, out, give the message out to people, I would say. No, that's honestly like very, uh, uh, very big, honestly, because I do live in Los Angeles. I do kind of mostly interact with people that are, or art individuals that are DJs, but it's very easy for someone to be classified as a DJ. But in your definition, I think it takes a longer time to earn earn that like title, and there's a big distinction there. And it, I think, the fact that you you've taken your time, uh, it, it makes it easier to, like, when you reach that artist identity, I think it's easier for you to feel like you can say you're an artist because it's, you've, you've taken your steps, you've earned your like you know uh, your badges, and it's it's it, it, I don't know, it's taken a good time to become an artist because nowadays you see a lot of artists that it's a year one year in they go from dj to artist to uh record label owner all at the same time and i, f I think the fact that you've taken your time gives you a very like i'd say wise perspective it's just more experience and uh i kind of want to share with the audience about like what what other what, what things other than being a dj that you do in your in your time outside of gigs and outside of um you know this trip is there is there anything else that kind of um brings your uh let's say i say cv or like your resume together like uh, I, I i wanted to talk to the audience about your experience with gate and just kind of what you do with them and how that connects to being a dj and an artist like the creativity it gives you or what kind of um perspective it gives you because i think you having that experience outside of 
being a DJ allows you to make the distinction that I'm a DJ, not an artist, because you do deal with a lot of artists. And yeah. they, that can, kind of gives you an idea that there are <laughs> levels to it. You know, there's more than just uh, uh, Jamie is not the same as Omar, not the same as anybody. Everybody's a little bit different. So what, what, what's that experience like? Uh, well, for, first of all, I am the NR manager of the Echoes brand, Echoes and Gates brands, Echoes from Agartha and uh, Gates of Agartha. And I do, I basically tackle all the problems with artists and, you know, I mean, always in the mail loops, solving problems, which is constantly problem solving. Always. It's basically like doing DJing, let's say. But uh, when you know how to communicate with them and s s maybe think two steps be before it happens, you're always prepared. It's like if you're always prepared for the worst, you're prepared type of, type of job that yeah. I have. And when I first met the guys four years back, uh, I've never handled that big of an operation, but they trusted me and we, it was me and my good friend Efe, Efe Kantar. He's also a really, really good DJ. Now he has his new track released too. Awesome. So a sugar coating from here, from LA. So we should say artist, maybe. Yeah, now so. he, he, he's <laughs> gonna be an established artist. Hopefully I will, I will be one day too. So anyway, we were like running around, solving problems, thinking fast. This, the second year, we knew how it was gonna go down, so we were prepared, okay. so it was easier. Third year, we had a team, and we were like curating the team. And it became easier and easier and easier. The problems get bigger, but the time that you solve them okay. is faster. You're so. able to scale it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. And now I'm working with the industry side with the Gates and Echoes brands, which I'm happy, thankful to. Uh, other than that, I've been in the industry working for Red Bull as a shrimp brand manager and the culture department intern. So that was in my early years, that was really eye opening to see how festivals are made, how brands adapt to events, how how sponsorships work. So that's I also have ideas about those type of things too. So that was I was lucky to be in those environments in early ages. And it's just every single day is a new quest. You okay. learn from them everything. And I think spending time in the industry and meeting people and seeing how they evolve is also part of the journey. It makes you a bigger person. Okay, so the, the diversity definitely gives you a better perspective. And I would say like dealing with artists uh, for like your work with Gate um, and you being a DJ, I think uh, gives you a, a new perspective also on how to deal with certain issues because a lot of times, I'm pretty sure as a DJ, you do face uh, some issues that you are also in the, in the email loop about. So you can kind of relate to the artists, for example, like, we're talking about very simple things from like you getting to the event, set time changing, uh, accommodations not given to you, or like the tech writer is not exactly what it's supposed to be. Uh, th that diversity I think is really important because uh, it's it's rare, I, I would say, for someone to be a DJ and also be involved in like um, in a festival experience or the background behind the scenes. Uh, m myself as an organizer, I started as an organizer before getting into music as a DJ or um, even trying to like evolve into an artist. It's given me such a uh, a very important perspective because it gives you more patience. Uh, we like knowing that, for example, I just I'm I just started being a DJ and like kind of getting into the industry it gives me more patience. Knowing that okay, like I belong, for example, in the warm up position. You're not supposed to expect X Y Z right away. It takes more time, and the diversity that you have is is quite important for people to see because um, a lot of people concern themselves only with being a DJ. They think you can't take on multiple positions or kind of be involved behind the scenes and at the same time being in the scene itself. Um, so I kind of wanted to bring that to the table for the audience to see it's, uh, as it's, I would say something rare. So I thank you for sharing that information. <laughs> thank you. Um, I kind of also wanted to, to, to speak about a little bit of what we're trying to do here together. Um, as we've spoken earlier this week, kind of creating something creative uh, for, for the scene, for the industry. Um, Jamie and I are, are working on uh, kind of creating, um, I would say, kind of like a, a mixture between um, mix mag style and a boiler room um, kind of production. But low key. In a, yeah, in something very low key, kind of uh, invite only, something curated for the, for, for the, for the music, kind of not really um, like something ticketed or something where people have to 
it's not a public event. It's kind of something more low-key just to give um, the scene a little bit more uh, respect, I would say, due to, like, uh, I would say the... It's kind of like a controversial thing to say, but there's a, a dip in the quality of music and production nowadays. Obviously, given certain reasons such as costs, increased costs, like you say, going out in Turkey now is uh, is expensive. It's not the same as before. And I would say that's also due to the increased production costs, so people have to increase tickets. Um, so I, I wanted to, to ask you, how do you feel about creating such experiences for um, the industry, for the scene? Do you think more people should be hopping on and creating like a like a live uh, live house music set in an intimate environment? What, what does that change for the scene? Well, I think like bringing people together in a good hangout type of situation is a good community building move. And when you build a good community, if you're surrounded by people that you could have a genuine conversation with and, you know, do a toast, it's about the little things. And when you give that space, if you open up that space, and people come in and see things from your screen and resonates to them, then they become part of a movement. Like, it's easy to just lash out money and try to bring a DJ and like t big talks. Like, I booked this DJ, now it's gonna sell. It's not like that. You have to, it's like, it's like DJing actually, setting the tone. Okay. You just have to open up the space. People have to come there. They have to feel that they're a part of that journey. So I think starting, starting small and getting different artistic perspectives because you could ask people how you could improve, which I think is really import, important. Okay. Some people are so close to... Feedback. Feedback, exactly. Yeah. But talking, improving together, seeing angles that you can't see from other people, I think is vital. It, it makes you grow and strive. Yeah, no, I, I, I wanted to touch on this topic mainly because... Um, nowadays we see the, the events that sell out. It's mostly like headliners, huge, huge artists. Um, like you said, people are like, oh, you're not, I'm not going to sell out if this artist is not here. And what I, what I usually see with kind of what I mentioned before, like the boiler room experience that's created online, uh, we see a lot of up and coming DJs, P DJs that are not, um, superstars. I would say they're, they're very talented. They're very artistic. They're up and coming. Yet you see the boiler room filled with a thousand people, two thousand people, yeah. and people are not relying on is this artist a headliner? Is he is he does he make this music? People are there for the quality and for the credibility that the production has built. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like the first early years in boiler room, uh, they used to just say they were doing a party, and you wouldn't even know the lineup. You would just buy tickets. Yeah, it just says boiler room. And TV. when you go there, you would see oh shit, Swam, Swam Waff's playing, and then you would be vibing but you're already there you're, yeah you, exactly yeah so you came for the quality also yeah when boiler room uh created their experience here in los angeles it was kind of kind of a similar thing they release just boiler room tv this day tickets for sale and then the lineup would come out like a week before so people already have their tickets people are going and they're there for the for the quality and the reason i brought up this topic is kind of just to separate like separate and kind of give note that there's not the the quality of production is kind of going down as the scene is changing and how important it is for uh, creatives like uh, like yourself and myself and people that are trying to make an impact in the scene to to really like um, give the, the production some respect and just put the effort in to kind of give give the audience what they really need, especially with the changing, uh, I would say the, the changing scene once again. Um, other than that, I kind of wanted to to talk about, like you said, you're having your off time right now and do you do you give that yourself every year or do you is it just because right now it's the off season and you thought it would be a good idea to come out and take some time off for yourself and how important is it to have time off does it give you more clarity creativity uh kind of more time to work on yourself how, how does that work out for you well when you're touring constantly and moving from one place to the other uh it wears you out really fast and taking time off and letting everything go for your body and because I'm an overthinker and it's, it, it doesn't necessarily make it easier when you're always on the road. The only thing that I genuinely like being on the road is I genuinely sit down. I don't even listen to music while I'm just traveling around. I'll clear my head. Uh, stopping for two months is the first time I've done it since the, did it since the pandemic. But I've, I thought, I think it's been beneficial for me because, uh, 
when you have gigs piled up on you and you're constantly rushing from one gig to one gig, you get extremely tired and you don't, you don't perform in the same energy all the time. Uh, but when I came here and I haven't been playing music for a long time, when you have like a small party or a gig, you get extremely motivated to play music. It's like the f early times of your career and you cherish that moment so well. You take everything and you try to read the crowd. It's just, I think like taking time off is good, but you, you should definitely work on other cards that you can hold in your hand. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, the diversity that you have kind of gives you also the ability to do that because some certain individuals, they rely on um, their their gigs and kind of their tours, um, not not just to keep the income stable, but also to provide social media content to, to stay relative because we know how if you are out of the scene for three, four months, you're not posting, you're not showcasing the audience that you've built, that you're still kind of in the scene, you're kind of still up to date. People do like forget, I would say. Yeah. People like to see. Uh, well, I would. I don't want to mention only bigger artists, but we see how like when there's artists like Solomon Dixon, they're on tour all year. They're always there. That kind of gives the audience a, like a like a little nod, like, "Hey, I'm still here. This person's still <laughs> relevant." While we see like a lot of artists that take some time off, come on, come back on, uh, unless they have new music, new tracks to bring, they kind of fall out of the loop. Um, so it's important that you take some time off. And I, I, I would say it, it does add to the creativity because it, it makes you excited to do something new, something different. And uh, for me, starting this podcast has given me some more time off to um, kind of invest my time to create an impact with this. And it's making me more, more creative. Like what we mentioned with the production that I'm trying to create, um, the, the intimate mix mag, boiler room. I don't want to keep using that, but it's kind of like... And when I thought about it, it gave me that was kind of the vibe. The that, influence, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of the influence, the 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 intimacy that the these two productions create. That's I think one of the reasons I thought about that idea is because I took some time off. I'm working on the creative side of things, kind of to bring an impact. And now I, I've come up with this new idea. And like like you said, if you were on tour here, kind of busy with like five, six gigs, it wouldn't give you the time to be able to participate or kind of uh join in on this. Uh so the time off is definitely quite important and like you said, traveling around is is not. I mean, it seems fun from the outside. It's definitely exciting, especially in the beginning when you first start the tour. But I think over time, it it does wear you down. You know, it is a full body experience. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I, I can only imagine. Like, I I've I haven't been honestly. I, I haven't traveled too much. I would say, but I've had a few weekends where I'm in in Miami and New York and LA at the same time, all all through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and it's quite exhausting. You know, it's it's not something that. Um, it's fun in the beginning. My first time doing it, it was exciting. It's it's kind of cool as a as a as a DJ or an artist to to be kind of taking that next step and just traveling around. But you told you've mentioned to me before you play all around Istanbul sometimes multiple days a week. Yeah. Um, do you uh, do you play different uh, like different scenes every time? Is it a club scene? Is it a house scene? And what wears you down? Is it the travel or just the connecting with with different people all the time, socializing or what, what kind of aspect do you say gives you that, like, you know, I'm tired? Uh, I don't want to be a hater or anything, but I don't live in Istanbul, by the way. Okay. So people know. Uh, it's like an eight-hour trip for me to get to Istanbul to play shows. Okay, by car. There's also Izmir, yeah. Okay. Also with the flight, it's, it's the same. A few hours. Still. You can't avoid anything. It's no, there's literally yeah. no difference between a flight and the, taking the car or a bus. Uh I, I get worn out with the socializing part a lot because you always have to have that persona working. It's like a social mask. And keeping that up all the time, you you just forget who you are sometimes okay. on like a really, really, really strong period of time. And like, I think a person should know, know who he is or she, who, know she, who she is and try to be genuine. But... It, like talking with people and trying to be genuine with everyone doesn't really work. That's why you put on the mask and sometimes acting like a person you are not doesn't do it for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I first of all, I don't want you to, to say you're not a hater or anything. It's just uh, the reason to ask you this question is just to give uh, people an idea of what, what we go through or like what a DJ goes through when they're traveling. Because a lot of times you, you go to a show, you're trying to interact with one of your favorite artists and then they're kind of tired 
They're not trying to take a picture. They're not trying yeah. to talk. They're not trying to like uh, dance with you. They're just there and they're tired. So I, first of all, I don't want you to like feel like you're giving a negative response. But it is true that, you know, like a lot of times you, it's your second gig of, of the weekend or third gig of the weekend. And you have to put that mask on and uh, I don't say pretend, but just kind of give people what they want and give yourself also the, the proper image and personality because at the end of the day it is a it is a personality it is it's about keeping your composure together and plus the psychological fact about it is you you const i don't it, it happens to everyone i think you constantly try to prove yourself and trying to prove yourself and putting yourself to a limit or anything is wherever you replace yourself but that's also hard and sometimes if you don't click, you don't click, but you take it personal. You're like saying like, why didn't it click? Sometimes it's not about you. Like taking time off made me realize that, th that this is the situation. Like I used to be really hard on myself. I didn't click, I, the energy that wasn't right. I, I, t I tend not to blame it on people all the time, but sometimes I, I do. But this is not how it is. Sometimes it doesn't happen and it's fine. Get on with it. I think mental health is a really, really big issue nowadays. And some people can't take it. Some people do. But nobody's wearing a metal casket or a full body armor. You're exposed everywhere. Plus, I think it's, this is going to be explicit content right now, but drugs also changed the environment 100%. now it's really accessible and people on drug highs are really really different it's like they shift just like our djing performance they shift from one person to the other and you cannot recognize your best friend at some point yeah and that i think it's really scary because you you have to be balanced you have to be well centered in so many ways you, you can't go to a gig fucked up let's say it would kill your image. 100%, yeah. Especially for someone who's obviously not able to keep their composure or like st keep, stay who they are. And like you said, when you have a full weekend of traveling, of, of sorry, like uh, indulging in this, like the drug use or having people around you that are also, you know, affected by the same thing with the growing, you know, use in the scene, it, it does change who you are. And people need to also understand that kind of uh, perspective that when you're out dealing with, with all these uh, different individuals and, and these different events, it's it's kind of really important to realize that everybody's, um, I don't want to say on a different high, but they're, they're in different stages of their night. They're in different stages of their weekend. Not everybody's been uh, out all weekend. Some people have been out all weekend. Some people are tired. And as artists or as a, as a, a DJ or someone, you know, involved in the scene, <laughs> it's it's funny, you know, because I, I, I do know how when you, you know, have gigs all weekend, you're, you're tired by Sunday. You're, you're not like the same person you were on Thursday, whether you are sober, whether you are not sober, it's kind of the same thing. And like you said, it's uh, the mental health aspect of it is kind of unspoken about because we don't really touch down on, um, on the artist perspective of things or the audience. I know, I do know that, you know, the, the increasing use of like different drugs has, has caused the scene to change the audience to change. Uh, some parties rely mostly on like, you know, if there are drugs, I'm here. If there's no drugs, I'm not here. And as as the DJ themselves, like you, as once once again, you said you cannot show up fucked up. You cannot show up uh, uncomposed. You have to kind of be yourself. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. No, I mean, you can. <laughs> you 100% you can. I mean, uh, uh, obviously that's that's personal preference everybody has those drunk days yeah everybody <laughs> every, everybody has those different days and i would say you know you can i mean obviously every person's uh able to do whatever they want but some you, you also like you said when you do indulge in these things you you're not yourself or people change and they're not who they you know you you think they were and i think also you might think that you're this kind of person that you know like is able to perform while they, they've had a bunch of drinks but in reality, if you were sober and you haven't indulged in these kind of things, you would know that you're better off kind of presenting yourself as someone who's just there to do their job and get out of there. Like playing music sober would actually be a really, really big challenge for DJs now. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it is. I mean, 100%. You know, like we all know, we all know how it is. And you know, we kind of want, I want, I want to be transparent about this kind of topic because um, you said it's explicit content. It's, it's something that unspoken you know because it, it is kind of taboo a little bit for a lot of people some people also 
do not like to sh share their um, indulgence in, in drinking or drugs or any of that, or any of those things. But it is rare to see a DJ kind of just, you know, hop on there, no drinks, just water, get their job done and get out of there. Usually the artist side does this better, by the way. Okay. Because they have this image that they're building. Like when you're a DJ, you could easily get a bit more wild than expected. Okay. But if you're an artist and you have a lot of things that you have backing onto, you can't go up and fuck up. You can't. Yeah. That is not an option. And do you think some of them think that they're able to handle it, but then you see them kind of like... Yeah, they think they can handle it, but okay. usually they don't. And it's funny, like, you've also done it. I've also done it a million times. Think about playing music drunk. You would always think that you're playing amazing music and you would have a recording of the night, right? So next day, you open your computer, plug your ESP stick in, listen to the recording. You would hate yourself. Yeah, no, it... it <laughs> You would hate yourself. You, you think, yeah, like you said, I, I told you, like people think you're doing, or you, you think you're presenting something great. Uh, but even music selection changes. You know, you pick the right. The, you think this is the right track, but you're a little bit, you know, it's all in your head that. that yeah, moment. you've had a few <laughs> drinks and you're like, oh, this track. I had a good night last time. I played this track, and you try to mix it, and it's like has nothing to do with the track before <laughs> it. It's like it's like a whole different thing. You know, no, this is. I, it's very common, I would say. Like, you know, I, I do, I do go out a lot, and I don't want to say I've personally done that. You know, just not to expose myself a lot. But you know, I've, I've, I've witnessed it a lot. You know, the different, different, different music, the beat matching is just completely off. You know, like, you know, a few drinks in, and you're like, you, you don't hear any beat matching issues. Everything sounds great. So you know, it's, it's important to touch on this topic. You know, especially with in relation to mental health, in relation to keeping composure on on stage, and you know, giving giving the audience what they want. At the end of the day, this is a performance. It's a show. You're you're getting paid not just to play music, but also to give the audience, you know, a good cur curation of of the night. And that's also why we have different uh, sorry, different rates for different artists, different DJs. Not everybody is paid the same way because if you're someone who's been doing this for a long time and you've kept composure and kept this professionalism that over 5, 10, 15 years and been able to curate a good night every time, you do progress. You do get better. You do. People do respect that. And uh, I, I don't. I do want to keep, you know, presenting this uh, kind of exposure to this topic because it, people can also understand. Upcoming DJs can also learn that this is not a party. You know, even though we're going to a party, we're going to play at a party. This doesn't mean we can in, in, indulge in the same way the audience in, is indulging. Or let's say you're playing a set at six in the morning and you're there from midnight. You can't party from twelve to six no, and then pause. and then get on at six. You know, that gives you a whole different perspective on the party and you you get tired you know you do have to be at like top energy give yourself the right like uh, mind, mindset to, to to get up on stage be able to read the the dj before you and give the crowd what they want hey it's you shouldn't be necessarily imposing a sound all the time you shouldn't be considering yourself as the man the alpha you should just play along with the lineup you're in i think it's an important side to look at things because when you start doing that, you, the set time that you play, and the music that you play and select becomes more valuable. And like taking a crowd from zero to 50% and doing your job right results in dance. Because if you get the right groove, you would get people going always. Yeah, you avoid people from sitting down, you get them on the dance floor. Sometimes it's better than taking them from zero to 100 when you have three other artists in front of you. Instead you know? of imposing, you should open the space that people resonate to you, which I think is an important point at this point. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think there's there's a lot of uh, artists or DJs, once again, I, I, I do have to use both words now since we've created like a differentiation. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody saying they're an artist and, but they're, or they're a DJ, but uh, some, 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 some of us do take it zero to a hundred percent. And then by the time you're halfway through your set or the time you're done by, with your set, now you haven't left any room for anybody, for any other artist to give, uh, continue the night. Some you've, you've ex exposed people's ears because it's, you've played all the, all the bangers, all the hard stuff. And now you, the, the person next, next to you or after you doesn't have the ability to keep it going. So it's, it's quite important. You know, I think it all ties together at the end of the day from, uh, you know, being, uh, I would say, sober or realizing or giving yourself um, 
a perspective that, okay, I need, I need to be in this kind of state. And that ties in together into giving the, the audience what they really uh, need, need or like kind of what they're there for. So touching down on this topic, I think is quite important. And thank you for sharing like what you've, what you've shared with us. I don't want to uh, get too much into this topic because I think it's endless. Yeah, it you know, is. We, we can keep going back and forth about it and it's, it's kind of a, lo- a little bit difficult to, uh, to pinpoint like uh, right or wrong. Obviously, every, every person... There are no right or wrong. Yeah, exactly. No, subject. I think every artist does have their own, uh, their own agenda, their own routine. I know some, some people like to you know, go to bed until it's like they have a late set. They like to sleep all day. Some people like to party. Some people like... It's, it's really just... It's subjective. It's you know? a personalized. Yeah, it's a personalized thing, and uh, it's it's hard to uh, to say like once again right or wrong. But it's important to give an idea for people th- to know that there are certain behaviors that you need to avoid, certain behaviors that you need to curate for yourself. Because once again, it's not a party; it's a performance. It's a paid for performance, just like when you go to the circus. I mean, or when you go to um, like a I don't know, like a, a Broadway show. You know, like there are these people are paid actors, paid actresses. They're they're here to give a show, and if they're drunk or they're they've had a a, a whole day of not sleeping, they're not going to be able to to put on that mask and give you the, the the character that they're presenting. So, it's it's a it's an invaluable topic to 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 speak about, and I think it's uh, it's important that I continue to present this kind of topic to on the next episodes also to bring different perspective, not just from you, Jamie, like from every other uh, guest that I have. Because that would build kind of like an idea for people to know, like, okay, like some people prefer it this way, some people don't prefer it that way. And moving on to like next, I would say, uh, what's what's this year looking like for you coming back into your on season? Um, what, what are you excited for? What's uh, what's new for you this year? Uh, well, I got my first international gig in Romania. Okay, I'll be playing in Buc- Bucharest. Okay, uh, awesome. for Le Petit on this. 12th of April, so that's my first international gig actually. And after that, we've got Gates of Agartha happening in Croatia. Um, getting out of Turkey and like traveling to other cultures and regions is going to be something that I'm going to be excited for, let's say. I'm not really feeling it yet because I'm on holiday right now, but when I go back to Turkey, I'm definitely going to start feeling the heat. Yeah, it's I coming say. up soon. It's a month, exactly a month from today, yeah, exactly. I believe. We're on the 12th Almost of March. Month. So it's it's a month from now. That's exciting. But I, you played in Los Angeles. So you've it's you've yeah, had yeah, an yeah, international yeah. gig. But it's still, it's, it was like a holiday. I I have played in Greece, but okay. after the pandemic, now I feel like I have the chance to go and play music. Like the after party, which I played in Echoes for the past two years, created a really really big buzz, and now I'm actually getting the re- rewards for it. Also okay. trying to keep the composure that I have. Um, sometimes it, I can't, sometimes I do, but I think I'm doing a good job, like balancing it out, learning and listening to people's opinions about me, I think is vital. Yeah. That's, that's a big one, honestly. Like, uh, I think I used to be a- really, really close to people's opinions. I used to, I also, have, I battle anxiety all the time, but, but battling anxiety is easier when you talk to people. Yeah. You can listen to people and you can build your own energy field. Yeah, people understand you better as well. You know, people do understand uh, when you're kind of straightforward, transparent with them. Uh, but like you, like you said, it's, I think it's something really important as well, uh, taking feedback. Uh, whether an artist or an organizer or anything in the scene, really, we, I, I think there's a big struggle uh, with people taking feedback or criticisms about the smallest things. Uh, from, from artist or DJ to organizing, like when, when there's an event... Organizers are very tough about taking any feedback in terms of improvements, um, whether it's on a small scale or a festival scale. Um, and as artists, many artists don't like feedback. The second you... Uh, also, once, I wouldn't say artists because an artist would take feedback. I would say DJs. You know, uh, uh, they're, as we defined a DJ, a DJ is there to curate or be able to adapt. And then when you, there's a DJ that's not, that's not there to adapt. They're there to showcase their sound. Um, they struggle to take any feedback. Like, hey, I think you should have, you know, played played it a little bit, you know, a little bit less tone, give, given it a little bit more uh, progression rather than just open up your, the, the whole night with complete bangers. Uh, I mean, it's just, I, and the other side of it is just words flying out. You don't have to take everything personal. Yeah. Just take the stuff that resonates to you. Yeah. 
And don't go asking everyone. You could ask like specific people, people that you value, and you won't, you won't feel that offended. No, no, honest. but the people that don't take the criticism are usually people that don't ask for it. You know, yeah, like exactly. we're talking about like, uh, uh, let's say you, me and you are, are friends and you had a gig and then I come to you and then I tell you, hey, Jamie, like, I think you could have, you know, eased in a little bit more into the your set. And we're friends, you know, you didn't ask for it, but I'm a good, I'm a friend of yours. I also, I'm in, I'm in the same kind of scene and I think something could have been better. Most people don't really take that, like, uh, they take it very personal, you know, they yeah, take they it get like, offended really fast. They get offended. I used to be like that too, by the way. It's yeah. like you learn and you grow from these type of experiences. Okay. You could just like, if you have a bad night, it's a bad night. Like I said before, it's a bad night. It's not the end of the world. It's not your last performance. You don't need to fight yourself about it. You could just think and be like, yeah, my energy wasn't right. You, you could look for the reasons. And work on it for next time. work yeah. on it. And it's always nice to share and learn knowledge from people. Yeah, I think with, with a creative kind of, uh, with anything in the creative industry, like music, arts, uh, when it's kind of like your work, you, pres you just presented your work. It's like a presentation and you just gave it, gave it out. It's hard to accept the fact that, you know, you had a bad time or you had a bad night or something wasn't right, something bothered you. Um, and what would you say like helps you with learning that kind of attitude towards it? Because that, that's, that's a very positive attitude because uh, as I said, it's art. You know, you should be proud of you. When you have these good nights, it's a different feeling. You're yeah, very, you, you have you're that proud. euphoric thing running you're, for your veins. Yeah, you're, you're super proud. You're super happy. You're like, you you know you just you know gave the audience exactly what they wanted and you also made a name for yourself and it's they're all it's all it's building blocks obviously so if you have 10 good nights in a row um you create that big cloud of euphoria i would say yeah there's that dopamine that builds up you know like uh, even when i say like you played one set on thursday or friday you had a 200 people now you played again on saturday or sunday for another party and there's 20 people so it's immediately going to give you that uh, perspective. Okay, I'm not going to have a good night immediately, you know? No, man. I mean, playing to 20 people might be more intimate than you think. Like, No, no, 100%. But I think your brain creates the dopamine that 150 people... I don't want to give like this small difference, but like you had a night full of full warehouse, full stage. Uh, you had the best set. And then you go into the next one and you don't see the same energy so you, you kind of maybe impose on yourself that this is not like the I night. I think this is an individual point of view. Okay. Because like the person I am, I like playing to smaller groups sometimes. Okay. Because you have the chance to chat with them and they directly look you in the eye. And resonate a little bit. Exactly. Right. You have a pure connection with a small group of people. When it's bigger, you just look far away. You don't really try to catch on yeah. with anyone like eye to eye connection wise. So I think every stage in every environment has its own perks and its downsides as well, obviously. You just balance your way through. No, I mean, I think that's also, uh, you, I need to give credit to the kind of person you are, you know, giving, uh, I'm, I'm giving you just a, uh, a perspective from someone who's around a lot of uh, newer DJs or newer artists. They're kind of just new into the scene, and uh, obviously, with your you know ten year experience, I think it's given you such a wise perspective on things. You know, you're able to um, not just accept things or nights for what they are, but also you 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 grow to learn that you know a twenty person crowd can be a lot more fun than a bigger crowd. But that takes time. It takes uh, the patience, and I think the improvements that you made amongst like your identity. Um, so I would say you being dreamy that's that, that's a complete you know pat on the back for yourself i think you need to be given uh, a little bit more credit for that as <laughs> i think it's it's hard you know because i i want to i want to comment on this as myself i played a gig in new york uh, a few weeks back a few weeks back and it was a lot of people you know and i don't want to say uh, i'm always looking for a lot of people but what i got used to here in los angeles that when there's a small crowd it means it's not it's not an intimate type of crowd it's just like a tired crowd yeah, or, I get what you mean. You know what I mean? So I haven't had the experience over time to have a lot of gigs with a smaller crowd and still know that this is a good night. For me, it automatically, like, I had 200 people this time. It was great. When I have 10, 15 people, it's not going to be great. So, like, I think your experience over time kind of made you, you know, uh, maybe look forward to nights that are more intimate, nights that are uh, more personal. And I think that also makes you come out of the, the night happier. So, yeah, no, uh, th 
uh, that's such an important perspective. And once again, I want to thank you for all the information you're sharing because um, I, I I want to bring more artists and DJs that are uh, in this scene for a long time and able to give people this perspective. Um, other than that, I don't I don't really want to take too much of the time because um, we've we've kind of jumped into detail about a lot of these uh, topics. And I just want to share kind of what we're working on together in the next uh, two weeks before you leave. Um, this Saturday, uh, I'm working uh, to organize an event with Jamie and uh, a few other uh, artist friends of mine. And I, I want to, I, I just want you to comment on how different it is to play in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, when, when, you, when you're in off season compared to when you play in Istanbul, it's on season. Uh, do you do you get more excited to play in different different areas of the of of the world? I would say now, what's what's your what's your feeling about it? Like uh, it doesn't have a lot of differences to be honest. Uh, but obviously, stopping and not playing on like a weekly basis, um, you tend to overthink about the party. Okay. So it, it, you would make yourself more nervous, more anxious. But the second you mix the first song, you're always in okay. the right place. If if it if it's gonna go bad, it could go bad also. By the way, that's okay. also fine. But yeah, you get more excited definitely in my perspective. Yeah, I do remember like the other week we mixed it at home and it was yeah. like it's kind of refreshing after a while. Like you yeah, know, that so. was that was amazing. Yeah, we had I'm a, gonna remember that for a long time. Yeah, we had it. such a good time. You know, <laughs> I think we both wanted to to uh, to play, and you know, it was kind of just me and you. And we we had a good time, and you haven't played in a while, so that was that was pretty special. And uh, it's like riding a bicycle. Yeah, basically. honestly, <laughs> it, it made me really uh, kind of excited to to create this event that I'm working on this this upcoming Saturday because I wanted to see, wanted to give you the opportunity to, uh, even though it's your time off, I still wanted to give you the opportunity to to bring your style and your music to the city. Uh, but I just want I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast and sharing your your insights, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to record some of Jamie's music. Um, you know, as, as we do it next, uh, next week in a set and uh, give you guys uh, a little taste of like what he brings to the table in terms of style and um, 10 years of experience into, into playing music, the, what he curates for the audience. So yeah, thank you, Jamie, for coming on. And Always uh, a pleasure, brother. I'm uh, looking forward to having you this Saturday and creating something special with the other production that we were talked about. So yeah, thanks again, Jamie. And it was good to see you and good to have you on. Let's uh, yeah, let's let's end this there, and uh, I want to thank you guys all for listening and tuning in. Uh, I'm looking forward to having you guys next week uh, on our fourth episode of the Artist Pass. Uh, it's been such a great pleasure uh, cre creating this uh, kind of uh, atmosphere for you guys and kind of bringing more exposure to a lot of topics. Hopefully, we can get into it more uh, as we ha host more guests and talk about these explicit contents that you know not many people talk about it's um it's very important and it's uh, i think it'll bring more perspective to the scene from the outsiders and people that um are not into the scene because i do think we do have a little bit of a negative um uh kind of uh you know outsider perspective and it's important for us to uh, make sure people know exactly what we go through as artists and djs and uh what we're trying to present as an image so thank you and uh we'll see you next week